years or so, uh, since the uh, early stages of the whole field, and uh, Associate VP for Research at the university, and some of my responsibilities uh, there involve some tissue banking issues. And so I'm going to talk this afternoon uh, a little bit, and what I wanted to do is uh, have as much interchange as I can with the uh, audience. Um, I was sort of anticipating perhaps a breakout room as opposed to an auditorium, so it's going to be a little bit more challenging, particularly with the lights here, but I do want to have some dialogue with you, and so I'm going to try to get through some slides and then entertain some uh, uh, feedback. And I think what the general theme of this conversation is going to be is that this is such a hot area now, uh, certainly within academic institutions, but also within biotechnology firms, and there's a lot of problematic issues with the development of biobanks, specifically related to the ethical issues. Of course, a lot of background infrastructure types of issues that uh, uh, are important. But the ethical issues are proving, I think, to be a significant challenge with many of the enterprises uh, nationally and certainly at the institutional and local level uh, that are um, quite problematic. So I'm not going to I'll probably offer too many uh, final solutions for you uh, with many of these questions, but I want to outline the questions, and then I do want to pose a particular scenario that I'm particularly interested in, and uh, along the lines of newborn screening, which has been the uh, dominant theme here of the uh, conference so far. So I'm going to pick up on that theme with respect to the retention and research use of residual newborn screening samples. So let me see, actually, first uh, within this crowd, how many of you have uh, professional responsibilities that relate to biobanks. Okay, pretty uh, substantial portion here. How many of you have your tissues in a biobank? Okay, perhaps not so many. So these are problems that other people have. <laughs> All right. I'll, Everybody has to start out with a quote here, so uh, got to find a quote that supports your theme. The most serious and intractable issues in health law and ethics are raised by the collection, storage, and use of tissue samples. Imagine the vast amount of personal information contained in stored tissue samples. <clears throat> I think we probably pick a variety of topics that uh, folks would say is the most interesting and important area right now. But uh, as I mentioned, this area of biobanking has become enormously hot uh, and complex. So. Um, I'd advocate uh, the, the truth of that statement. So increasingly common element. Uh, part of my job at the University of Utah is uh, oversight for the IRB. <clears throat> I don't chair it, but I uh, oversee the enterprise. And what we're seeing is a consistent inclusion in clinical protocols now for acquisition of samples that are tied to that clinical research. And so um, tissues are sent, sent off oftentimes to sponsors questions about intellectual property issues, uh, et cetera. But the real issues from an ethical perspective, from my point of view, is the issues around control of those samples from a consent perspective, protection of the human subjects and uh, honoring their wishes with respect to what happens with those uh, tissues. So a lot of different kinds of questions could be answers with tissues. Genotype, phenotype correlations, of course. Environment phenotype correlations uh, uh, are relevant. Pharmacogenetic research, uh, pharmacogenomic research, and toxicogenomic research, all uh, interesting, new, exciting uh, modalities of research that, uh, for which tissues can be enormously useful. So here's the basic point, of course, and uh, um, pretty straightforward. Storage of tissues permits access to human subjects. And we'll talk a little bit about how the regulations view human subjects or define human subjects, but for the most part, when you have a piece of tissue, you have uh, an entity that can be analyzed from a variety of different perspectives to obtain information on that individual. And so these can be tissues that are acquired for clinical purposes and then diverted to a research enterprise, or they can be acquired for research of one type or another, used for that application, and then potentially transferred to other research applications. And so obviously the research can be conducted that's remote in time or place. <clears throat> and as our technology becomes increasingly sophisticated to do analyses on small amounts of tissues, then the ability to conduct uh, probing research on those samples uh, at a time that's quite remote, years, and with individuals who had no initial contact with the tissue source uh, at the beginning and conducted for reasons uh, for which the tissue source has 
no conception or provided no explicit consent uh, during the acquisition of those tissues. So that's the nub as far as I'm concerned of the ethical issues that are raised in this domain. Now, part of our challenge at the university, and uh, I think our institution is like many, that uh, is not uh, quite at the cutting edge of this uh, biobanking enterprise, but uh, following in a second or third wave. And what we're anticipating is several levels of progress. We want to put together a bank to begin with, and we're thinking about a virtual bank within the institution to understand what it is the institution has throughout its uh, many different um, subparts. And then once we have a conception of that enterprise, then down the road, the power of that enterprise will be augmented by having data repositories of a variety of different sorts that can be linked back to that tissue repository. So we've got electronic medical records now. So we won't be limited by whatever data is immediately tagged to that tissue source if the tissues have not been anonymized, then we can link that back to the medical record and obviously access the information and uh, uh, a wealth of detail. Family history records. Uh, Utah is uh, one institution that has a particularly rich source, uh, Utah um, pedigree, that originally came out of the uh, LDS church pedigree activities. And so we have many generations, uh, multiple millions of individuals with complex pedigree information that has proven to be enormously useful for identifying high-risk families for genetic conditions that then can be recruited for gene identification or localization studies. Cancer registries, of course, uh, are uh, prevalent around the country and public health records as well. We'll talk more about newborn screening and uh, um, the types of electronic records that are increasingly being linked to members of the general population, uh, immunization records, uh, et cetera, that uh, would be relevant to this type of research for kids. So one set of ethical challenges that we'll talk more specifically about today is with the tissues themselves in developing a repository. But then I want to um, uh, just uh, state that the next level of this organizational challenge, I think, is going to have more ethical challenges and as we link these databases uh, together in ways that may not be transparent to members of the general public who may think that they have li are living in a world where uh, uh, privacy reigns when in fact there may well be tissues information databases that uh, are acquired as part of our normal daily routine but can be tapped by investigators to answer uh, important questions. So here's a regulatory definition. Human subject means living individual about whom an investigator, whether professional or student, conducting research obtains either one, data through intervention or interaction with the individual, or two, identifiable private information. And so the IRBs consider research with tissues that uh, are linked with individual identifiers to be human subjects research and obviously under the purview of the IRB to review and uh, uh, determine whether that's uh, uh, appropriate research or not. Now, it's also federal guidance in this realm that IRBs are pretty consistent about to say that the establishment of a resource itself that's going to be used for research is considered research and under the purview of the IRB. So this is a matter of tension with many of our investigators who say, well, I'm just setting up a database or I'm just setting up a uh, tissue resource. I'm not uh, conducting any work that is uh, hypothesis driven. So it's not really research. But as far as the IRB is concerned, as far as federal regulations are concerned, if you're setting up an enterprise that will be used for the purposes of research, then it's a research enterprise and setting that up uh, must be conducted under the oversight of the IRB. All right, so use in research uh, is human subjects, uh, as I've said, uh, uh, if tissue source can be identified. Well, what does that mean? This is a matter of conflict within the federal regulations and it can be challenging depending on the nature of your institution about what sort of definition one needs to follow. From the human subject perspective or from the common rule perspective or 45 CFR 46, that, those regs state that it's identifiable uh, if the identity of the subject is readily, can be readily ascertained by the investigator. Well, what does that mean? You got a, somebody's name on a tube of blood, of course, that's readily ascertained. If you've got a code number that can link them uh, immediately back to the medical record, can that be readily ascertained? Yes, uh, one would say that could be. Um, 
For the most part, any of those sort of linking things are considered uh, readily ascertainable, but that's a fairly low standard. HIPAA, on, uh, in contrast, has a much more complicated or much more uh, rigorous definition of uh, de-identified and uh, involves the 18 identifiers or states that uh, the individual could not be identified by an expert who's knowledgeable in the field, for example. So that's a much more stringent uh, definition of identifiability. And I think one of the active debates now nationally that's emerging is this question of whether a DNA sequence per se is a sufficient link to consider uh, any uh, DNA sample to be intrinsically identifiable uh, because each of us has a unique uh, genetic sequence. Now, I'm not in the camp of folks who uh, are willing to make that um, claim at this point. I think that there's uh, too many appropriate firewalls and in, in addition to the fact there's not reference databases out there that will say um, who you are based on your genetic sequence. I think the supposition or the hypothesis is that, well, not now, but within 10 or 15 years, read out a, somebody's uh, sequence or um, more than uh, uh, 20 SNPs or so, and you'll be able to identify that individual uniquely. Remains to be seen whether that's the, the case, and that would be potentially uh, a real challenge for the conduct of research in this realm, which oftentimes depends on these samples being de-identified or anonymous. So what are the ethical issues raised by research with human tissues? Um, I'm on the uh, uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee for Human Research Protections, and we just had a panel discussion uh, two weeks ago uh, at our most recent meeting, and we welcomed uh, a number of different scholars to come in and talk to us uh, about tissue banking, and the complexity and number of the issues was uh, uh, quite impressive. And there's real pressure within the research community to pay attention to these uh, issues because folks are are challenging. I think part of the answer our group came to was that while everybody's interested in these issues, there aren't uh, clearly right or wrong answers to the point where it's ready for any recommendations about additional regulation. I think that's uh, right for additional discussion and analysis. So here's at least a couple of the issues that are uh, current. Who owns tissue samples? Um, from this perspective, uh, Catalonia case recently, the folks may be uh, familiar with, uh, has gone through uh, some uh, judicial, uh, through the courts basically, and determination made that research tissues, uh, tissues acquired under research within a university context are owned by the institution as opposed to by the uh, investigator who acquires those tissues through uh, a grant. And I think this has probably been answered to a fairly uh, a definitive state at this point. It may be overturned by higher courts, but uh, this opinion was quite strong and straightforward. There was not serious consideration by the uh, judge who decided this case that the individuals themselves who are the tissue sources were the owners. And the investigator who wanted to take these samples and had the permission of some people to take them with them when he left the institution wanted to say it's up to those folks to decide what happens to their tissues? They own them. Well, the court did not seriously consider that um, particular option. And so the prevailing opinion right now is that institutions who acquire the grants, who obtain the samples, obviously under appropriate guidelines like uh, uh, the common rule, is the entity that owns the samples, at least owns with respect to having uh, operational control over those. What are the risks to individuals from research with tissue samples? And I'd be very interested uh, uh, when we have a chance for uh, more dialogue here in a little bit to uh, get your perspective on this uh, uh, particular set of issues. Uh, as I've watched the national dialogue on this and uh, uh, looked at some of the literature here, it's very difficult to find cases in which individuals have been harmed by virtue of use of their tissue samples. Now folks will claim that they have been uh, harmed in some circumstances because somebody else made money by uh, patenting a cell line from them and that they therefore failed to uh, gain a piece of that uh, economic pie that was developed. But that's a different form of harm than what we're usually talking about here. Has someone been harmed by virtue of the use of tissues? Uh, the Havasupai Indian case, I think, is probably the one that's most prevalent in my mind that's problematic here. And this is a case in which tissues acquired for certain research enterprise with uh, this Native American group were transferred to a different institution and used for a different form of research. 
that was socially sensitive without the permission of the, the tribe or of the individuals who had uh, submitted those samples to begin with. Uh, the tribe is suing and is understandably uh, outraged that uh, legal case is ongoing and I think illustrates uh, a looser management of samples than had than in the past and I think is uh, more common now within academic institutions. So this wasn't actually a harm to specific individuals by virtue of use of the research, but a sort of dignitary harm by an institution or individuals taking those samples, using them for an unacceptable uh, research purpose. So we need to be attentive to those sorts of uh, community issues as well. And that's really this third point here, defining the risk to racial or ethnic groups from research with tissues. I think this is actually one of the more interesting aspects of this domain and one that has been somewhat less evaluated uh, from my perspective in this situation. Uh, unusual for individuals to be harmed here, although they can be if research results are returned prematurely, uh, results that an individual didn't understand or wasn't anticipating, etc. Um, but when communities may have tissues used for purposes that would, uh, the community would find objectionable. And then as we've seen in certain circumstances, uh, mutations can be labeled by communities of origin. So the Ashkenazi uh, uh, Jewish uh, genes for breast cancer, for example, uh, part of the common lingo a few years or so ago, uh, Ashkenazi mutation panels, those sorts of things. And so there is certainly a risk that certain types of genetic findings will be linked back to communities. Now maybe that's neutral from a uh, perspective of uh, discrimination or stigma, but maybe it's not. And if you find adverse genes, uh, uh, for conditions that are stigmatizing, then uh, one might easily understand how communities would uh, seriously object uh, to that. And uh, even within my own community back in Utah, uh, Utah population database is that so-called Mormon database that has all the genealogies. The church tracks how that information is used. And they don't want that used for certain sorts of uh, research and issues that relate to uh, pregnancy termination, for example, uh, would not be a welcome sort of research with that. So those resources were used for purposes which the community specifically objected. Again, one can understand how uh, a certain type of harm, a dignitary harm, uh, a harm to interest would be, uh, um, would flow from that type of research. So we need to think broadly about the type of harm we're thinking about here. So I think most of the ethical issues really relate to this question of how much control should individuals have of these pieces of ourselves once they move into the research realm? How obligated are we to pay close attention to what it is people said they wanted about their tissues? Or does the fact that we can anonymize them, eliminate the possibility of individual harm, free us of any constraints that might have been provided by that consent process? And here's one of the specific questions that our IRB runs into pretty much on a weekly basis. Is consent for unrestricted future use acceptable? And here the regs are um, problematic. Uh, common rule, 45 uh, CFR 46, is silent on this specific issue, but for the most part, the regs, those regs would allow this sort of consent to uh, be uh, included in a process, consent process. HIPAA specifically says you need to ask consent for the type of, on a project specific basis for the research that you are doing. So our institution has fought this issue uh, um, uh, frequently in the last couple of years or so because increasingly pharmaceutical companies and even a lot of the uh, uh, cancer collaboratives, for example, want to say, we're going to ask consent of individuals to do what we think uh, whatever you want to do basically with these tissue samples. We don't want to be restricted to any particular applications. Our IRB has tried to say, well, that's contrary to HIPAA regulations, and the response has usually been, well, why is it that you guys are the only ones making noise about this and all of the research enterprise that we're involved with? And as I talk to other institutions, they're hearing the same thing, actually. You know? So it's a common, perhaps, negotiating tool to say, why are you the only one who's making noise about this? when in fact uh, perhaps a lot of institutions are. Again, once we have a chance to do some dialogue here, I'll be interested in uh, your own experience in this realm. Uh, is your institution allowing you to ask for unrestricted use of future samples? What's the role of the child assent? Um, 
typically one would acquire ascent for these uh, tissues. If you acquired the tissue prior to the age of ascent and the child now reaches that age, say seven, is it incumbent upon the investigators to go out, contact those kids, and see if they uh, provide you permission to continue to retain those samples? This will be an issue with the National Children's Study in probably eight years once the first kids get to be seven years uh, of age or so. Should consent be obtained when subjects become adults? So again, same kind of issue. You've had this tissue in your bank for three, four, five years. You acquired it on kids. Now you know those kids are achieving adulthood and you're still retaining those samples. Is, par is parental permission that you acquired for initial retention of those samples sufficient or is it appropriate to go back to those now adults and ask for permission to continue to retain that sample? Now you can obviously see how uh, such an ethical requirement would be enormously burdensome for any research enterprise. This wouldn't be a one-time thing unless your whole cohort was the same age when you recruited them. This would have to be some rolling set of responsibilities that as your cohort ages into adulthood, you would have an obligation to go out and contact those folks. They really just aren't uh, specific standards in this regard. I think from an ethical perspective, one wants to say we ought to be giving folks these choice choices, but whether that's necessary given the low level of risk and the high level of impracticability of conducting those sorts of enterprises, I think an active uh, uh, debate is necessary. So let me move to a case discussion, but before I do that, let me see if uh, there are um, any comments folks would have or, or questions about the uh, broader set of issues I've sort of outlined about consent. Yeah. Yes, and that's actually specifically the case that's going to be presented here in a second. And what we do know is that um, the majority of states permit individuals to opt out of newborn screening in general for philosophical or religious reasons or both, but we also know that families aren't effectively informed that they can opt out. And so the actual impact of the opt-out uh, availability is quite limited. And for the most part, health departments are okay with that because uh, uh, the kids end up getting uh, screened. The research interface is exactly what we're going to talk about here with those samples, and I think it raises some really uh, important and complicated issues. So let me defer more comment about that for a minute. Yeah. I have a few observations from my experience working as a consultant to an IRB and a state agency at the state of Connecticut. Uh, one is uh, that in addition to ethnic and racial groups, there are other communities or groups that have the possibility of being harmed uh, by virtue of this research. And a very vulnerable group are children that are under the guardianship of states uh, where researchers see these as an easy source of data to to follow, particularly in behavioral genetics research, ah. where uh, they can follow the children um, and they can particularly link their genome uh, to be behavioral problems that they're assuming will be occurring in uh, greater frequency than with uh, a match set of children who are in normal families. So um, my experience, uh, well, and one other thing, I think that IRBs, even in some of the best universities, have a fundamental conflict of interest. And I have seen them recommend to researchers that on this issue of reconsent, consent 
that it is um, the potential use of the data should be maximized and the protections should be minimized and they'll even cross out when the researcher puts in specific uses to make sure that the data can be used in the future for unknown research purposes. Uh -huh. So um, I, I would at least say from that experience that behavioral genetics raises problems that other forms of genetic research perhaps don't, or at least greater problems. Um, and secondly, that we need to be sensitive to other communities that aren't defined by race and genetics, although in some cases may overlap with them. And uh, the, the third concern I have is, is just the lack of understanding of some IRBs as to what the implications of giving free use of this genetic data may, may be in the future. Uh, that also was the case with regard, um, we had various focus groups, and interestingly, the focus groups of the children themselves were much more willing to be banked because they thought scientific research was important whereas the focus groups from the community were more sensitive to the possible harms. Uh -huh. And that also suggests if we're going to ask for assent or consent from children, that they may need to be educated before we do so. Yeah. All right, wonderful points. Hopefully that was audible to folks in the back there. And I would pick up on uh, um, at least one of those points. I think the the comment you make about the vulnerability of kids who may be wards of the state and who have intersecting um, attributes, which would be perhaps a higher prevalence of uh, risk for behavioral problems, perhaps behavioral problems, uh, and an uh, intense interest in uh, genetic research that will look at the intersection of things like child abuse, for example, and um, adverse psychological outcomes, and there's been some fascinating work that uh, does show potentially that certain uh, kids with certain genotypes may be more susceptible to adverse impacts. And so the uh, point's very well taken that there's some extraordinarily vulnerable groups out there because of their a priori risk because of the rich data set that's associated with them and then potentially access to those tissues. So, good. Other comments? disconnect to some degree that a lot of the research is in the private domain. Um, any comments on who has access to the public domain um, from, you know, the private sector and can, that, can they actually um, be sold? Can this, can this intellectual uh, property of sorts actually even be sold to the private sector? Uh, the answer I know is yes, because that's happened within our own uh, state. And um, what I'll show you here in a few minutes is the fact that uh, while the majority of states now have some policies relevant to uh, the acquisition and, and use of these samples, they're not particularly de detailed. And as with other areas of newborn screening, a lot of variability. And so I think it's up to states to develop particular policies about who gets access and under what sorts of circumstances. And presumably that would all be conducted under IRB uh, approval, but it would be up to individual states to decide whether they wanted to make those samples accessible to outside commercial uh, interests. And so uh, uh, Utah, for example, um, had a genetics company that was interested in the question of what's the population prevalence of uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2. So used residual newborn screening samples to uh, answer that question. Anonymized samples, of course, but uh, useful from the development of their test standpoint, probably useful for the uh, overall welfare of the public, uh, perhaps, but um, potentially problematic uh, relationship there between commercial enterprises and uh, uh, tissues that have been acquired for a very different purpose. All right, let me go through this case uh, um, then, or this particular uh, uh, application, uh, and uh, we'll no doubt have some more conversation uh, later. So um, this is pretty obvious to, to this group. Um, 
Residual spots are available for almost every baby. Retained, obviously, to enable retesting should there be a test failure, uncertainty on the initial test. But for the most part, on virtually every baby, you've got residual uh, dried blood spots available. A couple of reasons states have said that they retain these things for variable periods of time. And I'll show you what that distribution looks like. Confirmation of test results, of course, uh, the most straightforward. Um, quality assessment of current test modalities. Uh, you want to have a set of tests that are a set of spots from kids who you know are affected and who are unaffected, and you can uh, improve the quality of your test in terms of sensitivity, specificity, etc. Forensic uses are uncommon, but uh, uh, not unheard of by any means. Postmortem disease identification. Sometimes you'll have a second child affected and a first child who died. And it may be that that residual specimen is the only uh, good remaining biological specimen from that first child. And you may want to go back and say, well, in fact, did the first baby die because they had uh, this particular uh, condition? So useful for that type of purpose. And then again, uncommonly, but sometimes this is the best specimen available to identify a child's uh, remains um, from a uh, uh, DNA test uh, standpoint. What I'm most interested in uh, is this question of research. And the research, of course, can relate to newborn screening to develop new tests or uh, improve the quality of existing tests, or it can be entirely unrelated to the newborn screening enterprise, like the example of BRCA1, BRCA2 uh, population prevalence. Uh, at least at this point, nobody's talking about BRCA1 testing in uh, uh, newborn blood spots. But states also have reasons for discarding them. And we'll see some variability here. Uncertainty over the stability of samples. And uh, this is being increasingly clarified um, through some uh, research to say, how long do these metabolites stay good within the sample? And does it, is it meaningful to test a sample five years later? And if so, what are the storage conditions that need to be uh, uh, maintained in order to have that sample be any good? We do know that DNA-based testing uh, is good for a long time. Uh, on these specimens. So there's no question about that. Storage costs and space, uh, always an issue for uh, poorly funded public health programs. No clearly defined justification for storage. So uh, what's the point unless you have uh, clear justification? Lack of informed consent for retention. We'll talk more about that. And then potential legal liabilities. And I would say this is a little bit of a um, uh, justification that's somewhat under the table level, which is to say that um, if the residual sample shows that we blew the first test analysis, then that's contrary to our interest. If those samples don't exist, then there may be some protection that, uh, um, from our program that we didn't screw it up the first time around. Here's uh, results of uh, Brad Therrell's project from a couple years ago now that shows the distribution. So about half the programs are six months or less, and that's all that you would want to retain them in order to um, use them specifically for the validation of the initial diagnosis. But then you see the spectrum of uh, um, periods of time following that up to uh, eight programs indefinitely storing them. I think both New York and I believe California are saving them indefinitely, aren't they? So these are large storage uh, programs. 37 states have policies governing the use of residual samples and 23 programs have a written usage uh, policy. So that's to say that um, I think that's a little bit misphrased. 37 have policies about uh, the, the retention and the acceptability of retention, but fewer have policies that really articulate who has access and under what sorts of circumstance would one get access to these samples. So here's a couple of possibilities here that give you the pros and cons with thinking about how these samples might be used. Anonymize them. So strip them of their identifiers. Take your uh, punch, put that blood spot in a, a bag uh, without any connection back to individual identifiers, or perhaps only um, general identifiers, perhaps racial group, perhaps uh, uh, something at larger than a zip code um, uh, designation, geographic designation, etc. Very valuable for epidemiologic research. Obviously, you can tell the prevalence of uh, conditions within the population. Research does not involve human subjects under the US regulations. If you've anonymized it, then it's no longer human subjects research. And that flows then that there's minimal IRB review, which uh, um, some would think is an advantage. Others of us would see that as a concern. But, um, and then, of course, no consent usually necessary for anonymous use. 
although that still raises the question about whether you ought to be getting consent for the collection and storage to begin with. Now you have the opportunity, you've got some interface with that parent uh, in the acquisition of the sample to begin with. So two levels of consent then uh, are relevant to this discussion. Well, what are the downsides for anonymizing specimens? Well, you can't link it with the health outcome of the child. And I think it's particularly important given the discussion we had earlier today about the lack of knowledge of the natural history of these conditions, or many of these conditions at least. You want to know how certain genotypes or how certain biochemical analyses on that samples relate to how well the child has done. And if you've anonymized all those samples, then you only know which tests are positive and which tests are negative, and you don't know how those test results correlate with the longer-term outcome of the child. That's a huge downside for anonymizing these specimens, um, uh, and I think is central to the potential research use of these or value of them. Um, unable to collect uh, contact family with beneficial health information. Now this is another uh, important and controversial area with the use of tissue samples, which is when is it acceptable to return results to the tissue source? And as I mentioned, the uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee uh, talked about this, and this was the single largest conversation. Part of the conversation was this issue of when is it acceptable to return results? When can you sit on results if they're of uncertain clinical uh, validity? So that remains a hot debate. Uh, as well that's uh, intimately tied with this whole biobanking enterprise. Um, but under any circumstances, if you anonymize it, then you can't get back to the parent if you've got something of critical importance to that parent and child. All right, so let's talk about link samples then, and that's the alternative. What are the pros? Health tracking possible. Enormously valuable in uh, really understanding what that uh, sample is telling you. And return of health information is possible. And even if one is in the camp as I am that thinks that you shouldn't be returning results very often, there are circumstances that uh, may be life uh, uh, saving for the child that one would want to return information. And so re retaining that link obviously enables you to do that. What are the cons? IRB review and oversight necessary. Should move that into the pros, but uh, it's sitting there in the cons. <laughs> Informed per <laughs> form permission may be necessary which of course undermines the whole value of having the specimen already. I mean, the beauty of these things is it is on every kid, and uh, you get it without a complicated permission process. You're now saying, I gotta go get permission for it, then why don't I just go get blood on the kid now, rather than uh, rely on this uh, system that has been designed around newborn uh, screening. Return of information may pose a risk to the child or the family. So that's sort of the downside of the return of information. Maybe you don't want to have the ability to return information when that information is either wrong or misleading or uh, won't be uh, beneficial to the child. So again, an item that's familiar but perhaps uh, deserves some uh, emphasis. Permission usually not sought for newborn screening, only two states. Uh, Maryland and uh, Wyoming and District of Columbia have a permission process for newborn screening. Now, in saying that, uh, I would say the per permission process for the most part involves getting somebody's signature on a form. I've not been convinced that the actual process is fundamentally different in those states compared to states that don't have a permission process. I don't really think parents have uh, a great deal more understanding in those situations than they do elsewhere. And we also know, and I don't think I have this on the slide, that. Um, the vast majority of programs do not speak to the, uh, of uh, information brochures that go out to parents, not even consent, but the brochures that are stuck in the bag when you're delivering a baby don't include information about the retention and use of samples. So it's not even effectively disclosed in the majority of programs. Okay, um, so two types of consent or permission uh, in the pediatric context might be uh, worth thinking about. Permission for the retention of samples for research purposes, and then uh, permission for the specific research use. And how would folks think about issues that would be specific to newborn screening conditions per se? At least as child relevant. Or how would folks feel about the question of uh, broad authorization for uh, a wide spectrum of research uses? Uh, Utah, again as an example, is currently using uh, newborn screening residual dried blood spots on an anonymous basis for looking at heavy metal exposures prenatally. 
So we get information about which babies have had exposure to which heavy metals, and also which communities seem to have higher levels of exposure than others. So at least a couple different levels of information that can be uh, acquired. Now you can waive consent under the regs for a couple of reasons, and I think there's ethical foundation for this, so it's not simply a presentation of what the regs are, but uh, you have to meet all four of these. Research involves no more than minimal risk. Waiver would not adversely affect the rights or welfare of the subject. Research could not be practicably carried out without the waiver. And when appropriate, subjects can be provided with pertinent information after participation. So here's a question um, for you. I think the most uh, critical questions here are one and three. Uh, talk about three for just a second. It becomes challenging when you have an interface with the parent as part of the health process to say it's not practicable to get consent. Now I've gone from a position a number of years ago where I really thought informed permission for newborn screening was a good idea to a point now where I recognize that it's not feasible to get meaningful informed consent in the postnatal period. There's just too much going on. It's just not a high priority. There's not a meaningful dialogue about this issue at that point. Prenatally, though, I think there's some real opportunities. And we're doing some projects that are going to try to focus on this question of can you get meaningful informed consent for newborn screening prenatally and potentially have opt-in, opt-out possibilities for uh, this specific uh, question. So practicability, I think, is an open question about whether an IRB would say it's just not feasible to get permission. I think many IRBs would say that that's um, a, a criterion that could be fulfilled. All right, but what about number one? Is research involving no more than minimal risk? Is that applicable to newborn screening use of dried blood spots? Or would it depend on what the nature of the research was or the stringency of the confidentiality and um, how often the file cabinet really got locked or password protection of the uh, computer codes on the computer? I wonder whether anybody has got any thoughts about uh, whether you or whether your IRB would consider genetic research with the residual newborn screening uh, spots to be minimal risk. I think they would um, definitely want to know that there were security systems in place to, to prevent uh, the risk of disclosure of the information would be one thing. And I think they definitely would want to know whether you were planning on informing the parents of any results that you were getting because uh -huh. of the possible um, adverse effects that could have in the, in the possibly uninterpretable results you might get from your research study. Uh-huh. Good. And so if results were going to be returned, then it might be higher risk, might be conceivably more than minimal risk right. so, uh, compared to uh, no results under any circumstances. Correct. Okay. Yeah. In, in the state of Washington, I believe our IRB uh, would indeed make a judgment about minimal risk. Uh, we've actually been challenged to do that. Uh, they determined that the particular study did involve more than minimal risk, but they were certainly open to considering it. And, and the key issues for them were what are the likely consequences of, of the testing that's going to be done, especially looking to uh, evaluate a, a disorder for potential addition to a screening panel. And uh, so they were looking specifically at you know, what are going to be the consequences of a false positive, uh, is there treatment available for these, and, and what is going to be the actual impact if the test turns out positive. But, but they definitely did consider it. So this was a circumstance in which the, the investigators were anticipating returning results to the yes. families? Yes. Okay. And say again, uh, whether they considered that project to be more than minimal risk or? This one they ended up uh, believing that it was more than minimal risk. Uh-huh. Okay. Because it would identify some, some kids uh, who, had, who had potential risk but unquantifiable risk of disease at a later age. Uh-huh. Okay. And does that then mean that uh, consent was obtained from the parents for use of those specimens? Uh, the study was redesigned to use an anonymous protocol. Uh-huh, okay. Uh -huh. Any other thoughts on this or experiences with uh, your systems? <laughs> 
I would say from my perspective that one of the things that has been problematic, and I think uh, a lot of us who are part of the speakers group for this conference have been involved in these conversations for 15 years or so, um, there's been some significant uh, overhyping from my current point of view about risks associated with genetics and genetic testing. And I think that uh, the so-called ELSI community has, uh, to some extent, shot ourselves in the, the foot with this. A little bit hard to tell whether the high level of anxiety associated with uh, negative test outcomes uh, from a psychological or stigma discrimination uh, standpoint um, hasn't occurred because people are so concerned about it. Um, in other words, maybe that level of concern has been beneficial, or maybe uh, the perception was simply uh, uh, that, a perception. Uh, but we do know that the population in general has a high level of concern over these issues. And uh, from my point of view, probably a higher level of concern than the actual data on real instances of uh, discrimination or serious psychological impact would really uh, uh, justify. So, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the important element of uh, evidence-based medicine. And a lot of us push for evidence based around treatment, but there needs to be an evidence base for the concerns we have as well, which is the psychological impacts on families and discrimination, et cetera. And we can't too blithely claim that those are serious concerns without also having the data to verify that. So I think IRBs in general, is my perception, are pretty concerned about uh, um, anything related to the genetics in an identifiable sample. So I think it remains to be seen over time whether IRBs will approve projects with identifiable residual samples without a consent process. Um, I've made the claim elsewhere that I think in many circumstances it is minimal risk, but I think that's a tough conversation to, to have and one that you need to be thinking about in the context of your institution if this is relevant to you. Any other thoughts about this before I move on? Okay. Yeah, Adam. clinically significant findings. You, you mentioned it as a source of controversy. Uh, is it something which there's a consensus on in this country as to whether uh, you can withhold information about conditions that are not completely treatable or have ambiguous interpretation? I would say that there's no real consensus yet. So the question was, what, is there a consensus yet about the return of results in this type of uh, situation? Um, of course, in some circumstances, you will have made a commitment in the consent process to how you're going to manage that information, and obviously you need to fulfill that commitment. So if you tell folks you're going to give them results back, then you need to do so. If you tell them you're not going to give results back, then um, obviously any ethical obligation to do so is substantially reduced, if not eliminated. But in many circumstances, uh, consent forms traditionally have been somewhat silent on this issue. So the question then becomes, uh, when is it ethically appropriate. I think that at least there's some consensus out there, uh, at least within the LC community, that when you have a, uh, an evaluation that's not based on a uh, test with uh, established analytic validity or clinical validity or clinical utility, then uh, there's no ethical obligation to provide that information back. I think where we're going to be challenged is that many genetic tests particularly have good analytic validity. In other words, they'll, they'll target the, the right information on the uh, specimen, but yet you don't know how well that relates to the spectrum of clinical disease, and you don't really know whether you can do something effective to reduce morbidity or mortality. In those sorts of circumstances, you need to return those results. There's one sidelight, which is if you know, it's not a CLIA-approved lab, then you can't return the results anyhow, so that uh, is one regulatory. But if it's done in a CLIA-approved lab, uh, can you should you have an ethical obligation to return those results? Um, I'd say that's where the controversy lies, and I would say there's probably a little bit more weight on the side from my perspective to say there's not an ethical obligation unless you have some uh, fairly high level of confidence that that information is going to be helpful to uh, do something important for that child or uh, individual. Um, where I think we want to go from a regulatory standpoint is have OHRP mandate that this issue of return of results be specifically discussed so that folks are told when they enter this uh, research enterprise, if there's informed consent, um, that uh, whether they will or will not get test results. <laughs>
I don't know, others have any difference of opinion on that issue or other perspectives, yeah? Okay, sure. Okay, so the question is, uh, individuals as part of the regulations have the right, right to withdraw from research at any time. What are the implications of that for uh, retention and use of uh, uh, bank samples? And uh, HIPAA spoke to this a little bit more explicitly than the uh, common rule does. And I think the general interpretation is that once you've analyzed sample and you have some data, that withdrawal from the research doesn't require the investigators to pull the data out of the database. It requires you to pull the sample out of the repository so that no future research would be done with that sample. And of course, linking the samples enables you to do that, and individuals perhaps should know that if it's anonymized, they won't have the ability to have that sample pulled. But uh, that's my interpretation of how uh, folks are dealing with that withdrawal issue. Beth? Oh, okay, we'll wrap it up. One, one question I have is um, taking this down to the level of the parent having the blood drawn at birth, and I know we're at a bioethics conference, and, I, and I'm not submitting that public opinion should drive ethical decisions, but if you were to say, if we were to say, it's fine to use the blood spots um, for research purposes, it's within the purview of the public health programs, um, but the blood spot was collected with this implicit contract in the parents' minds that this was going to be used to help my child. And either they weren't aware of it, um, it wasn't on the brochure, or it's, it's not anywhere to be found. The potential public backlash, I mean, we know this happened in, in Minnesota. There's the issue of, of ethics, and then there's the issue of public tolerance and the implicit contract that seemed to take place at the time the specimen was obtained. I was wondering if you could comment uh, on that issue. Great, and I'll make uh, just some uh, final comments, because this really is the focus of a project that we've uh, just been funded by the Genome Institute to uh, address, and I'll tell you my perspective on it. I think that the preliminary focus groups that we've done with general public members about the retention and use of newborn screening samples is uh, uh, remarkable in that, first of all, folks have no idea, have absolutely no idea this is going on. Secondly, they find it uh, entirely unacceptable. They do want to give permission for this. Now, what we're going to try to do is look at the, um, how asking the question influences the public outcome. But where I want to go with this is to say that the process of individual informed consent is not feasible in this circumstance. But that doesn't per se say that we can leap over um, public concerns or public approval of this process. And what we need to do is try to develop a robust way to enhance community dialogue and see if we can get community buy-off on this enterprise. And we know that some members of the public may not like that. In fact, it may not be acceptable to have a community level uh, uh, engagement that provides that approval. But part of the problem now is that most of this or a lot of this is going on uh, in a subterranean level at this point. Folks have absolutely no idea. I want to make this a, a matter of public dialogue, transparency with how processes uh, are used. And if indeed the public, through their representatives, say, forget it, this is really a terrible idea, uh, then the process will end. But I think if folks understand the value of this sort of research, that, that from my perspective, community buy-off uh, will be an acceptable alternative to individual consent when the risks are, in fact, low. Okay, thanks very much.